evening, everyone. I'm Lauren Swartz, President and CEO here at the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. Welcome to our discussion tonight on the impact of technology and human rights all around the world. This program is part of the 2022 Philly Tech Week, and I'm happy to welcome you all, World Affairs Council members, guests, Philly Tech Week gurus, and our audience from around the world joining us for this very timely discussion. For those of you we haven't had a chance to meet yet, the World Affairs Council is an international affairs experience provider with over 70 years of expertise in connecting Philadelphia, our city, to the world. We curate programs like this one on how the world is changing around us for diverse audiences. We bring world affairs education to over 2,500 youth each year, and we provide professional development on cultural diplomacy, and we offer over 30 international trips to every continent every year. Tonight, we have leading experts and practitioners to unpack how technology is playing a role in human rights, the good and the bad. There's a digital program book on our website and it's linked in the chat with more information about our speakers and the program. Shortly, I'll introduce our very admirable and incredible discussion leader tonight and our panelists and she will facilitate a dynamic discussion for us all. And then of course, like always, we welcome your questions and your ideas. Please use the Zoom Q&A feature to submit your questions throughout our conversation tonight and we'll get to as many of them as possible. It wouldn't be Philly Tech Week if we didn't say we're also on social media. So we invite you to share your experiences and thoughts using the hashtag WECPHL to continue the conversation. And now I'd like to introduce Andrea Cayley. She is our program moderator this evening. Andrea is the co-founder, executive vice president and director of human rights and rules of law at EOS Tech Trust. Andrea is also an adjunct professor of international human rights at Villanova, Villanova University Law School. On background, Andrea has more than 20 years of experience prosecuting war crimes developing and managing rule of law, human rights, and transitional justice programs. She's carried out that work across the world, including in, in Serbia, Cambodia, and Liberia. Andrea will be joined by two experts tonight. The first is Jay Aronson. He's the founder and director of the Center for Human Rights Science at Carnegie Mellon University. And his research and teaching examines the interactions of science, technology, law, media, and human rights in a variety of contexts. His current project focuses on the documentation and analysis of police-involved fatalities and deaths in custody in the United States. He'll be joined by Lauren Bingham, Executive Director, the Institute for Law, Innovation, and Technology at Temple Law School. She's a globally recognized expert on nationality and migration law and human rights. As a legal practitioner, she's carried out investigations and litigations in many countries on issues such as the right to nationality and digital privacy. Tonight, this esteemed group will share their expertise on digital disinformation, protecting human rights using digital tools, digital and online privacy, privacy and strengthening civil society. Andrea, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight and your leadership and expertise on this important topic. I invite you to make your opening remarks, after which we will open up the discussion to our panelists, followed by Q&A. Thank you, Andrea. Good evening, Lauren, and everyone um, who's joining World Affairs Council tonight. Um, I want to start by thanking the World Affairs Council for organizing this event, and especially Lauren and Haley for making human rights part of the discussion at World Affairs Council. It's hoped that this will be the first of a number of events that will be focused on human rights. The one thing that jumped out at me when speaking with our panelists, Jay Aronson and Laura Bingham, to prepare for this panel is that we should have called it, should have called this discussion, Human Rights and Technology, a Double-Edged Sword. You cannot discuss the benefits of technology in protecting human rights without examining how technology is being used to suppress human rights. On the one side of the sword, you have works grouping to strengthen human rights worldwide, worldwide through technology. My group, EOS, is currently working on a low-tech solution for human rights groups in Ethiopia to monitor legal cases and create a database that can identify regional patterns of human rights violations. Bellingcat, 
an international organization based in the Netherlands, uses drone footage, live imagery, as well as social media and live witness recordings to show the world violations of human rights and to create a repository of data that can be used in future prosecutions of human rights violators. In Syria, they've collected imagery that's proven that chemical weapons were used against civilians, that weapons of Russian origin were used in the conflict, and that the Russian army had been directly involved in the bombing of hospitals. Bellingcat was also able to obtain footage to show that Russia's to show Russia's responsibility for the downing of Malaysia's air flight MH17 by Russian forces. They also show that Russia manipulated satellite images to put the blame of the attack on Ukraine. They used simply Adobe Photoshop. <laughs> Bellingcat has been collecting images and countering Russian disinformation with indisputable Im imagery and data in Ukraine since 2016. They continue to collect satellite imagery, drone footage, as well as eyewitness statements and social media postings in the hopes that one day these materials will be used to bring the politicians and military officials responsible for this horror to justice. Jay, tonight, will also be discussing his work using technology in Ukraine to analyze the protests and military um, uh, positions in the, in the earlier 2014-2016 protests. It's become normal to hear people in line at grocery stores talking about the horrors in Ukraine, to hear children talking about war crimes, regular people as much as politicians talking about genocide, mentioning the Geneva Convention. This is new. This is a new discourse, a new awareness, and it's due to the connectedness that technology, social media provide, and their ability to bring the horrors that are happening thousands of miles away into the palms of our hands. People are united in their support of Ukraine because they're seeing identical images of suffering and horror. Again, this is new, and the effect and impact of this new technology is pushing government policy and international diplomacy. To understand the massive effect of technology, one only has to go back to 1991 and the start of the collapse of the former Yugoslavia. Images of the conflict were visible on the evening news, specifically from 6.30 to 7 p.m. Sometimes it was the top story, sometimes it wasn't. As the war grew, newspapers occasionally moved images to the, of the conflict to the front page, but not always. A pivotal moment was on August 17, 1992. Time magazine published the image of an emaciated man behind barbed wires, behind barbed wires on its front cover. It symbolized the return of concentration camps to European soil half a century after the Holocaust and would come to define the Bosnian War. This image was seen on newsstands around the world and people woke up to the horrors that were occurring in Bosnia. Prior to this, the Bukovar massacre had occurred, Dubrovnik, a UNESCO World Heritage Site had been shelled, the siege of Sarajevo had begun, and cities throughout Croatia and Bosnia had been attacked and thousands of civilians had already died. Prior to the Time Magazine photo, these horrors were only known to those who had a personal interest in the region and who were following and taping any mention of the conflict and those who might have been caught, caught a mention of it in the papers or in the half hour of nightly news. There's no gathering of evidence of war crimes, drone footage, satellite imagery, nor was there a push for any government to get involved and no unified international call for the end to these crimes as we see now in Ukraine. There's no doubt that the Holocaust-like image from Bosnia was the wake up call that there was a war in European soil again. The response was swift to create uh, a, uh, the first war crimes tribunal since Nuremberg in May of 1993. And following that, under criticism for being uh, Europe focused, the UN established the Rwanda tribunal on 8th of November, 1994. This was a conflict even less people knew about or followed. The impact of technology in prosecuting war crimes and serious violations of human rights cannot be underestimated. The proof of villages being destroyed and civilians being killed in 1991, 1993 was witness statements. With luck, any luck, photographs maybe would be taken by UN peacekeepers who arrived on the scene of, of a war crime. The technological advances that are monitoring and gathering evidence of the crimes in Ukraine just did not exist. However, the needs of the investigators and prosecutors at the ICTY and ICTR are no doubt what fuel technological advancements in, in DNA detection evidence gathering. Our first panelist, Jay, has worked in this area and will speak about it, about facial imagery recognition, satellite imagery and analysis, the technology that has changed the way the evidence of war crimes is gathered. 
when I started speaking this in evening, I mentioned the double sword of technology and human rights. Well, the technology to protect human rights and prove culpability of its violators has grown. So has the ability to use technology to violate human rights. Technology has allowed China to conduct mass surveillance of its citizens using facial recognition technology. They collect all data on their citizens that includes internet searches, activities, and their internet gateway, which allows China to control all online activities in the country, severely restricts, a restricts access to dissenting and minority voices. Like many of the restrictions on human rights that China is introducing, the concept of the internet gateway is being adopted in countries like Cambodia. Much of, the, much of China's surveillance technology is being used by China to monitor its minority population, including the Uyghurs. There is documentary proof that authorities are also using vast secret system of advanced facial recognition technology to track and control the Uyghurs. The facial recognition technology, which is integrated into China's rapidly expanding networks of surveillance cameras, looks exclusively for Uyghurs based on their appearance and keeps records of their comings and goings for search and review. Chinese authorities already maintain a vast surveillance net, including tracking people's DNA in the western region of Xinjiang where many where many which many Uyghurs call home but the scope of the new system extends that monitoring into many other corners of the country last december the us reacted by placing sanctions on chinese companies commerce secretary G gina raimondo said the scientific pursuit of biotechnology and medical in innovation can save lives Unfortunately, the People's Republic of China is choosing to use these technologies to pursue control over its people and its repression of members of ethnic and religious minority groups. The use of technology to suppress human rights is not limited to China. Our spec second speaker, Laura Bingham, will discuss the NSO case involving Pegasus spyware, border techniques, and the emergence of accountability. Technology is also being used to spread disinformation worldwide. We are all watching as Russia spreads disinformation about the war in Ukraine, alters images to prove the version of events. Russia is far from being the only country using technology for disinformation. It is occurring worldwide, including in the US, and the power of the internet allows the spread of disinformation with alarming speed to an alarming number of people. Just as the technological challenge of war crimes investigators leads to technological in innovations, so the challenges to human rights by advanced technology are leading to techno technological innovations to protect human rights. My group, EOS Tech Trust, is working on a technology right now to monitor and counter disinformation in the Balkans. Both Jay and Laura will speak tonight about the challenges that they see both domestically and abroad and how technology can be advanced to protect those very rights that technology itself is putting at risk. Thank you. Jay, it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that introduction and for uh, the, um, the great way that you laid out uh, the issues that I'll be addressing. I should warn everyone that I actually um, teach a semester long class on, on these issues. Uh, and to try and um, squeeze things down into 15 minutes or so is hard. So I'm going to be very brief and uh, we will um, uh, hopefully have some time for conversation. So in the spirit of keeping myself um, to the time limit, I've decided to use a, uh, a few slides um, so I don't ramble. Uh, so um, I just wanted to very briefly introduce myself uh, and the center that I run at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I, um, uh, as Andrea mentioned, I have uh, been working in the, the, uh, the human rights documentation space for nearly two decades now. Um, originally, I was doing work on the use of DNA identification after conflict and disaster, and I uh, also spent time in uh, Sarajevo and in, in Bosnia um, in, in the aftermath of the war there. And I... Uh, um, sort of through a, a series of kind of um, fortuitous conversations, uh, got involved in a project on the, um, the science and um, the kind of philosophy of, uh, of civilian casualty recording and estimation in times of conflict. And that got me really interested in documentation more broadly. Uh, and this was around 2010, 2011, right when the Syrian uh, war was starting. And people started coming to me asking me about video. 
and how we could use video to document civilian casualties. And I had very little uh, experience, um, basically no experience, but my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon had, uh, I, I thought, um, uh, had some, uh, might have some, some tools or techniques or, uh, or just ideas about how to deal with the large volumes of video that were increasingly coming through um, social media channels and, and kind of semi-private channels in the internet to people who were doing human rights documentation. Um, but I very quickly realized there was no way for the people in the human rights community um, who had this technological challenge to actually in, interact with or engage with people in the academic community and the research community um, about the, the challenges that, were, that they were facing. And that led me to start the Center for Human Rights Science, um, which essentially tries to create partnerships between human rights practitioners and academic researchers, um, primarily here at Carnegie Mellon, but also at other universities as well. Uh, and uh, we have two main programs, a technology program where we um, both uh, gather challenges within the human rights community and, and try and solve them through the um, computer science and, uh, and um, other um, computer vision machine learning um, uh, experts we have here at Carnegie Mellon. And we also have a statistics program where we do data analysis and um, a variety of other things, both uh, in uh, uh, throughout the world and also around criminal legal issues in the United States. Um, so uh, in the spirit of um, kind of starting us off, starting the conversation off, um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what I call the human rights-based approach to science and technology. Um, that's uh, uh, something that I've been thinking about a lot over the past, um, it's been more than a dozen years since I've uh, been directing the center. Um, and really it's been almost two decades since I've been involved in these uh, issues more broadly. Um, and as Andrea said, it's, it's a, an absolute cliche, but it's totally true uh, that technology is a double-edged sword, both in our lives and especially in the protection and promotion of human rights. Um, the technologies that, uh, that uh, those of us who are trying to um, actually protect and promote human rights are the very same technologies that can be used by governments, uh, by uh, corporations and by non-state actors to violate human rights. And one of the things that I've learned um, through, through my uh, work and through conversations with a lot of people is that it's, it's I say very difficult, but it's actually impossible to extract the positive dimensions of the use of technology in the human rights space without also having to deal with the negative dimensions. They, they, they're one in the same. Um, they're the same side of the coin. They're not even two separate si uh, sides of a coin. Um, the, the, tech, the, the features that make technologies useful also make them quite dangerous. And the tools and techniques that I'll very quickly introduce you to, um, or at least the results of those tools and techniques are um, far more likely to be used against citizens and human rights advocates than on their behalf. Um, it, when we look at the world around us, I think it's safe to say that technology is almost always deployed by the more powerful, either for their benefit or against uh, explicitly against the interests of the less powerful. Um, there is inequality in access to the kinds of tools that you need to, to do the things that Andrea was talking about. And the methods of analysis are typically locked up in companies, in government uh, agencies or the military, um, or in universities. And people who are at risk for human rights violations typically don't have the ability to take advantage of them. Um, another thing that I've discovered in my, in my work and in, in uh, research in this field and in this space is that just because we have more data doesn't mean that we get more justice and accountability. Uh, so if you look at Syria, um, we actually have more minutes or, or more hours of video, um, more video footage uh, of the war in there than we actually have of the war itself. So if you added up all the um, the atrocities that we have on video, it would actually add up to significantly more time than the um, than the amount of uh, time we've seen this this uh, conflict drag on in Syria. Um, that doesn't mean that there's been justice and accountability. That's not to say that at some point in the future um, we won't see uh, some sort of truth commission or trials or 
uh, domestic um, uh, cases. But uh, what we cannot expect is for technology to rid politics from the struggle for human rights. It isn't just a matter of getting the right technology and suddenly all of the social and political challenges we face um, will disappear. I, I think that uh, some people who develop technology um, or who have a, a kind of weak understanding of technology will think that we can uh, develop technocratic or technological solutions to the problem of injustice, but that's just not the case. Um, technology is not magic, it's math uh, and, and science. Um, so keeping this in mind, uh, colleagues of mine, including uh, my, my uh, co-editor Molly Land, who's at uh, the Law School and Human Rights Institute at University of Connecticut, have really been trying to think about science and technology in a human rights context and using the lens of human rights. Um, we we uh, look at human rights law as a, uh, a place to go to find um, guidance for how we should implement, design, develop uh, technologies and use scientific methods in the world. And uh, so in, in this, this book, which you can, uh, the, the, the cover of which you can see um, uh, in this slide, we have sort of uh, developed a set of, um, of normative principles um, and, and this is a kind of simplified version. Uh, for those of you who are human rights lawyers, um, you, you might uh, recognize that these are, uh, you know, th these are different ways of saying things that um, you might say in a different way. But uh, in, in the spirit of kind of communicating broadly, we, uh, you know, I, I've, um, I've kind of made this a little bit easier to understand. Um, and so if, if I were to kind of give you the, the highlights of this human rights approach that we develop, we argue that, uh, that anyone developing or designing or implementing technology or scientific methods that are going to be used uh, in the world, particularly in a human rights context, need to attend to the needs of the most marginalized members of society uh, or need to be aware of the, the needs of the most marginalized members of society, not the most privileged, um, that technologies need to be developed and designed in a, in a way that when things go wrong, the people who are harmed have access to modes of accountability, to legal institutions that they can go to find redress. Um, we argue that ordinary people, um, particularly the people most affected by technology uh, or scientific methods, need to participate meaningfully in the development design and implementation of those, uh, of those things. They can't just be kind of brought in um, uh, to, to see the results and to um, you know, be amazed by them. Um, we need to recognize that there is a tremendous amount of power and privilege built into technology. So you might often hear that technology is neutral and uh, the way that a particular person uses that technology um, can be for good or bad. Uh, as I hope I've, uh, I, that uh, Andrea and I have sort of um, convinced you, if, if that's the approach that you have, that all technologies are double-edged swords by their nature and by their design. Um, it isn't that you can, you know, you can uh, somehow use a technology for good or bad. It's that whenever you have a technology, it has good and bad built into it. And the good typically, uh, the, the benefits typically accrue to the powerful and the harms or the risks typically um, accrue to the most vulnerable, or at least uh, the, the, the most vulnerable have fewer methods or mechanisms to limit the, uh, the risks and harms that they might face. Um, and finally, we argue that any use of technology in society or in a human rights space in particular needs to um, attend to the effects of technology, not just on civil and political rights, which we in the United States um, tend to uh, focus heavily on, but also on economic, social, and cultural rights, um, like the right to family, or the right to water, or the right to um, uh, a, a decent workplace, those sorts of things. Uh, the, um, the other kind of major uh, discovery or, or thing that we learned when we were doing this work is that um, the idea of doing no harm is not enough. Um, there's no way to avoid the uh, all of the harms of science and technology, um, uh, but we, you know, I, we do, we can with uh, in, in intent or intention 
reduce their impact on marginalized people, or at least ensure that more of the benefits accrue to those people um, uh, than uh, just simply dumping all of the harms on them. Uh, and I know that this is quite abstract, but uh, if, you know, if anyone wants to give me a technology, I can sort of um, lay all of this out uh, for them. Um, as Andrea mentioned, that most of the technologies uh, that are available in the world today um, have been developed with either government, uh, with, with the input of government money or, or uh, through corporate research and development um, for uh, particularly the technologies that I'm going to talk about um, were developed for military intelligence or public safety purposes. Um, the way that we at the Center for Human Rights Science have tried to um, limit the harms is by intentionally redistributing the benefits of these technologies from military intelligence and, and police uh, um, entities to human rights practitioners who can use them to look back at those, uh, that the, at those actors. So um, we can use these technologies as a form of counter surveillance, um, or uh, some might call it surveillance. So, uh, so kind of viewing from, from below instead of from above. Um, and, and finally, um, before I just do a very quick uh, example, I, um, I just wanted to present or provide a, a, some insight into the core values that we bring to every uh, collaboration or, or to every um, project that we do um, in partnership with human rights practitioners and communities. Uh, and those are collaboration, that we see ourselves as equals. Um, we don't see ourselves as experts who are coming in to solve someone's problems. Uh, we, we believe that the people we work with are the experts about their problems. Uh, and we might have technical knowledge or, or social science knowledge, um, but we see the, the work that, um, that we do uh, as co-equal with the, with the ideas and with the knowledge that our partners bring in. And so um, in the, the work that I'm gonna very briefly show you, when we published this, we included the, our, our uh, human rights um, uh, colleagues in the academic article that we produced about the work that we did. Um, we see our work as an act of solidarity. Um, we, we bring a tremendous sense of humility uh, to all of our work, particularly because we know how privileged we are. Um, we are tech skeptical by nature uh, in that we, we do see that technology has um, <laughs> some, some uh, good things to recommend, uh, but that technology does not solve social and political problems without an equal amount of social and political work. Um, that, uh, you know, it isn't just about implementing the right technology. Uh, we seek to build trust with our, uh, with the communities and with the practitioners we work with. And we recognize that good work takes time, that you can't just do a hackathon or spend, you know, a week without sleeping, drinking Mountain Dew or coffee or, you know, whatever stimulant you, you might choose um, and solve a problem, that these problems develop over decades or years uh, and solutions to them will take that amount of time as well. Um, very quickly, what, one of the many things that we do is around uh, the analysis of human rights media. Uh, this is any digital material that's produced by a bystander, victim, perpetrator, um, or ambient cameras like surveillance or CCTV. Um, you can find it in lots of places and learn lots of things from it. Uh, we've done work um, in Syria, Nigeria, Israel, Palestine, Libya, Mali, uh, Mali South Africa. Um, the example I'm going to show is from Ukraine, um, not because it's the newest, but because uh, Ukraine is in the news. Uh, and you can learn all sorts of interesting things um, if you uh, are, are careful and smart about the way that you analyze things. Um, there are lots of limitations with human rights media um, that I can't get into now, uh, but if you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, and just to, uh, I'm, I'm coming up on, I think I'm at 12 minutes now. Um, so what I wanted to do, uh, I, I've tried and tried to get my presentation about uh, the work that we did around the death of protesters during the 2013-2014 Euromaidan protests in Kiev, or Kiev now. Um, uh, it, this involved a collaboration between Ukrainian activists and human rights lawyers, uh, an organization called C2 Research that's based in uh, New York, um, the Center for Human Rights Science and my colleagues in the Language Technologies Institute at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and, and basically, uh, I, we, I, I had colleagues in the uh, human rights community who introduced me to these lawyers who were working with families of people who had been killed 
during the uh, Euromaidan pro-EU protests um, that took place in 2013 and 2014. And on a particular day, there was a, um, a, a bloody confrontation between uh, members of a uh, of what were called the Berkut, a, a riot police unit, and um, uh, and protesters, and uh, 48 people were killed that day. And uh, most of the members of this unit uh, fled to Russia, but a few of them were captured and were actually put on trial. Um, and to tell you the sad part, uh, first after um, two years of working on this project and the um, the case actually going to Kiev District Court. Uh, Russia and Ukraine did a prisoner swap um, uh, two years ago or so, and the trial just one day ended uh, and, and nothing happened to it. Um, but we do think that this is really valuable for uh, long-term historical clarification and understanding of the situation. Um, so I'm going to very quickly show this video, and that will be the end of my time. Um, oh wrong uh hold on. okay there we go uh and uh and then if you have questions you can ask me in the q a so um here we go the protests in ukraine that began in 2013 not only toppled the government but also yielded countless eyewitness videos day after day protesters and bystanders filmed the rallies in kiev against ukraine's president viktor yanukovych they filmed attempts by security forces to break apart the tent city that was built in independence square and the clashes with mass police that reached a violent tipping point months later. On February 20th, four police and 48 protesters were killed in one of the bloodiest hours of European conflict since the Cold War ended. Now, four years later, these videos are being presented as critical evidence against Ukrainian policemen who stand charged of killing these protesters. Working with incomplete ballistics evidence and amid rumours and denials about what happened, prosecutors hoped that a forensic analysis of the videos will prove their case. They enlisted the help of Situ Research, an architectural firm in Brooklyn with expertise in video forensics. Situ analysed hundreds of videos assembled by Ukrainian graduate student Evelyn Nefertari to recreate the shootings in painstaking detail. First, they built a virtual replica of Institutska Street, where most of the protesters were shot. Laser scanners were used to accurately reconstruct the fine detail of buildings, sidewalks and trees. And they modelled barricades and debris seen in the videos of that day. Videos show the Burkut, a Ukrainian paramilitary force, retreating along the street from clashes with protesters. The Burkut are wearing these distinctive yellow armbands. They take up position behind these barricades. We'll focus here on the death of Igor Dmitriev, a 30-year-old lawyer who had joined the protests the day before. He was with this group of protesters, protected by helmets and homemade shields, who followed the Burkut. Moments later, he was fatally shot. I should have, his shooting uh, was filmed by three cameras, uh, which helped was, um, to determine his precise violent, position uh, and that of the here. cameras. I, I apologize for that. By analysing the sound of the gunshot, Experts approximated the distance of the weapon from the cameras. And using their 3D model, analysts froze the victim's exact position when he was shot. They marked the entry and exit wounds described in the autopsy report to indicate a direction of fire within a few degrees of accuracy. Overlaying this cone of fire with the audio analysis gave the experts an approximate location of the shooter. Next, they examined videos filmed on either side of the barricade at the time of the shooting. One shows the fatal shot and a white puff of smoke rising near the barricade. And this is security footage recorded behind the barricade within a minute of that gunshot. It clearly shows Burkut police aiming and firing at protesters where experts say the fatal shot was fired from. Investigators repeated the analysis for two other victims. Lawyers hope that, by making order out of the chaos and disinformation surrounding that day, this innovative analysis will stand up to cross-examination in court. So um, the only last thing I'll say before uh, my time is up, actually, let me just, um, hold on one second, let me just put my final slide so you can get my email if you have any questions for me. Um, 
the last thing I'll, I'll mention is that you, you'll notice that Carnegie Mellon wasn't mentioned in that, uh, in that um, video that was done by the New York Times. Um, and that was because my, uh, my collaborator here at Carnegie Mellon received all of his funding from, uh, or most of his funding from uh, the US government's uh, intelligence um, research funding body, IARPA, and wasn't sure that it would be a great idea for um, that, uh, that um, funding to be affiliated so closely with this project. Um, and so that's, again, this idea that we at Carnegie Mellon are trying to level these playing fields but we are working with technology that is far more likely to be used by intelligence, military, uh, and corporate actors against ordinary people um, rather than for them. So with that, I will say thank you, uh, and I will um, stop sharing, and uh, I will um, let Andrea take back over, and I will go back on mute and uh, um, hide myself. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. And wow, very, very much uh, different than any sort of um, evidence we were introducing in, in the 90s at the ICTY. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. And I look forward to talking more about it with you. Um, now, our next presenter is Laura Bingham. Uh, thanks, Andrea. And um, thanks, everyone. Thank you to the World Affairs Council. Um, Andrea and Jay, uh, you've done an excellent job setting out all of the issues for me. Uh, I, too, will attempt to be brief. Um, so again, my name is Laura Bingham, and I'm the executive director of a new institute at Temple University uh, called the Institute for Law, Innovation, and Technology. Uh, I just joined Temple in October 2021 after a, a, a more than a decade as a human rights litigator working for the Open Society Justice Initiative. Um, and most of my work, as uh, Andrea mentioned, focused on the uh, focus on inequality and the rights of non-citizens. And increasingly, both of those fields came to intersect uh, during the course of, of my many years uh, with digital technological developments across media, consumer markets, public infrastructure. Um, I do have a slide to share, let's see. Okay, so uh, here you should be able to see um, the some snippets from our website, which is just launching um, and uh, also the URL where you can already go uh, head over there to sign up for our mailing list and um, hopefully reach out where we would love to collaborate, uh, just as Jay said. Um, so I hope that uh, once you hear a little bit more about what we're doing, you'll consider working with us. Um, so when Andrea and I first started talking about this panel, what we both realized was the need, um, as both Andrea and Jay have emphasized, um, to really focus on the importance of continued and also more diversified attention to the question of accountability, uh, accountability and technology. So Andrea and Jay have focused on technology's role within accountability campaigns for human rights atrocities, like those that are linked with the current war in Ukraine. I wanna use my time to make a couple of points on accountability for human rights harms, uh, which, technology falls within the chain of causation. And here I'll be gathering together a few strands of what I hope uh, and what I believe is becoming an increasingly coherent domain of robust public accountability tools that are available to human rights actors to address uh, these needs. And this is being fueled by coordinated research, like some of the work that Jay is referencing, evidence gathering and action. Um, my work within strategic litigation and legal advocacy campaigns has given me a real front row seat to the trends that have started to emerge in constructing human rights claims and seeking redress for human rights violations that are actually tied to digital transformations and digital tools. Um, so the first point that I want to make is uh, with respect to what I call networked responsibility. So this is somewhat in contrast to what we were first speaking about, um, where concentration of attention is on war criminals or even state actors um, as a category. I'm interested in the diffusion of responsibility for ultimate human rights harms across a complex network of public and private actors. 
So when we think about uh, human rights impacts of digital tools, whether it's on our privacy, freedom of expression, right to protest, uh, and, um, and equal protection, it's increasingly difficult to devise a satisfactory theory of responsibility, um, and especially construct an idea of what meaningful redress uh, for those harms should really look like. Um, so while there are corporate actors, especially that are drawing uh, severe criticism right now and legal challenges, if you think of Facebook, NSO Group, um, Celebrate, Clearview AI, Palantir, all of these names might ring some bells for folks, but it's not generally one isolated incident or one isolated actor that's carrying responsibility. Rather, it's systemic effects that create an ecosystem of harms in which people are caught up. Um, so I mentioned uh, NSO group. And uh, I'm just showing a slide here that has an image from a New Yorker Magazine article that came out last week um, that I highly recommend folks take a look at. Uh, NSO Group is an Israeli spyware company that sells a tool called Pegasus to law enforcement and intelligence agencies uh, in foreign countries. Pegasus is used uh, in simple terms to hack into your cell phone without your knowledge. Uh, it can turn on your camera, it can record you, it can track your movements, download your, your data, even data that you may think is on an encrypted platform um, like Signal or WhatsApp messaging services. Um, one thing that I wanna emphasize just on this theme of, of dis diffused responsibility for human rights violations. So NSO Group is creating this technology. The technology flows through a messaging system that's, um, uh, that's created uh, and, and managed by another technology company. It's sold to, Pegasus is sold to governments all over the world. And in the article, it's, it's uh, uh, noted that a UK research group has linked Pegasus directly to 300 acts of physical violence. Um, so there you see the intersection with some of the documentation work that Jay and Andrea have been talking about. Pegasus is also infamously connected with the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi in 2018, uh, although the NSO group has disclaimed any involvement, but um, Pegasus was found on devices um, of Khashoggi's family and, and friends. So here you have um, a real dispersed network of different causes and effects that are linked with this technology. Um, and one thing that I would point to is that some of the most prominent legal responses have actually been between tech firms. And so on this slide, I'm just making reference to a case, an ongoing case between uh, WhatsApp, now uh, Meta, which is the, also the parent technology, uh, parent company of, of Facebook, um, is suing the NSO group because of the hacking of, uh, of their commercial property. Um, and this case is links back as it's discussed in that in this article, um, and you can read more about if you research it, you know, it's the link to a uh, real geopolitical jousting between uh, Russia, China and the US uh, and, and some of the features of our current geopolitics that Andrea was referencing um, at the top. So this is far removed uh, from the construction of sort of individual and community focused human rights as a responsibility paradigm. Um, and the networked responsibility flows uh, that we see today is also being mirrored in the way that human rights practitioners are working to try to counter some of these harms. Um, I'm not gonna go through every tool that I've listed on this slide, but um, it's really just to illustrate the many layered um, sort of uh, and, and emerging, especially in the corporate accountability frame, uh, tools that human rights practitioners are finding recourse to. And this is where I see a real sort of emergent and necessary coherence coming together around which of these tools will work and how and what's needed to make that happen, to make them really have teeth. Um, and I would point to two sort of specific things here that I wanna emphasize about this, the, this wider practice of uh, human rights protections. First is that a lot of these tools, if you uh, look through them, are operating um, at the national level. So whereas international human rights, we have a whole framework, we have lots of treaty bodies, um, we have regional protection mechanisms, a lot of the important pushback 
a lot of the important documentation happens much closer to the ground where the fallout happens. And uh, actors are also learning how um, to network themselves across different national jurisdictions. And there's real emphasis on the need for more horizontal um, coalition building and exchange of information and knowledge and know-how, especially in the South-South space. Um, the second thing is just calling up this theme again of uh, double-edged sword or um, the term dual use technologies, which are technologies that have both military or lethal applications and can be used in a civilian context. Um, the quintessential example being nuclear technology. But um, human rights practitioners are uh, very much alive to this fact. Um, in addition to some of the examples that have already been given, uh, most a lot of my work has focused on, um, on national level or large scale biometric uh, digital identification databases. And one recent and uh, horrific example of how the, a tool like that has, has passed this threshold back and forth um, is in Afghanistan, where the government, uh, when the US was still there, had implemented an anti fraud uh, as an anti fraud measure a biometric ID database for government workers uh, to keep track of payroll. And when the US left and the Taliban took over, they also gained control of all of the biometric tools that had been left behind and uh, learned how to weaponize those in order to track down uh, and murder and disappear uh, go former government workers. So it's not, it's not a one-way direction. Tools can be deployed in one way, they can be used in another way, they can go back the other way. Um, and uh, linked with that, the last thing I would point to from this matrix is an emerging um, focus on human rights due diligence. Um, so just picking up on some of the points that Jay was speaking to about technical practice and some of the values and ethics behind it, human rights due diligence, again, this is applying in the corporate um, context, but a lot of corporate work is also intersecting with, uh, you know, through public private partnerships with government funding and government use of these tools. Um, so human rights due diligence laws require corporations to look within their operations and their supply chains and consider what human rights harms might be emerging from um, both their operations uh, in terms of labor uh, standards, uh, modern slavery, labor related violations, environmental violations, but also within their, their services and products. And that's where this concept of dual use is really key um, and requires more attention. I'm just going to um, stop my share. Um, the second point that I want to emphasize is the need for more transparency. So the truth is that any of the frameworks that I just referenced or you saw on my slide really won't go very far in an information vacuum. And transparency is a way station. It's not, a, it's not an end in, uh, in and of itself, um, but it's certainly needed for real protection, even, even from the norms and the, the regulations that we have on the books. Um, I want to emphasize here that uh, there's a need that's really urgent in the US um, as much as anywhere else, as much as in China, uh, because of the amount of digital surveillance that happens right here in the United States, often in the shadows. Um, so one thing I wanted to share with everyone is a, a report that just came out this week um, from the Georgetown Center for Privacy and Technology that looks just at the Department of Homeland Security's uh, ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement arm, what data did they have access and use in their work? And some of the results I think are quite surprising to the average uh, resident of the United States. ICE uses um, facial recognition to search driver's license images of 32% of US adults. Um, they have driver's license data on 75% of adults. They track the movement of cars in cities where 75% of us live, including in Pennsylvania, and they have utility data on 74% of US adults. So your electricity bills, your water bills, when you move and sign up for service, these, um, these behaviors are, are being tracked or they're capable of being tracked. 
My own center is conducting a mapping study of the police use of digital and internet-based technologies in, in the Philadelphia area. And our findings so far are consistent with the central conclusion of the Georgetown report, which is that persistent surveillance really permeates urban life and opacity. Uh, the lack of transparency is a real obstacle to an actual conversation about substantive legal protections. Um, as Jay mentioned, there's also a, a sort of a presumption of innocence factor here that contributes to this lack of transparency that uh, leads to um, what many have called, especially with respect to facial recognition, uh, the, the deployment of experimental technologies being released and scaled and shielded from scrutiny. Um, and I, I, I say a presumption of innocence, you know, because I think it's often assumed um, by many policymakers and the general public that uh, tech, new technologies and technological innovation will be will serve in the public interest if the technologists believe that it will serve in the public interests. Um, and that's a really strong presumption everywhere. Um, my research and advocacy have focused, as I said, on this rapid deployment of um, nation state scale the biometric digital ID systems, especially in lower and middle income countries. Uh, and they, there's well documented evidence that these have had um, drastic negative effects uh, in the form of exclusion of um, millions of people from social protection schemes. In India, for example, where the largest biometric ID system, Aadhaar, operates. Um, but even with all of this um, evidence that it's the technology that's failing, the, the, the fingerprint scanners don't work, especially for women and manual laborers who finger, whose fingerprints are worn down. Um, they don't work uh, in hot, humid weather. They don't work when they're not internet enabled, uh, in, when there's no connection. But India's Aadhaar ID system is still often uh, pointed to as a model of good practice. Uh, and I, I want to echo what Jay said. You know, I think this is this is uh, echoed over and over again by people who are in uh, positions of power and privilege, um, who have a lot of investment in seeing that uh, the technology is succeeding. Um, and I just again, I'm going to drop a quick resource in the chat on this that we developed um, for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. So let me just conclude with a few thoughts um, that I'm happy to elaborate on about what's to be done. Uh, these are not comprehensive, um, but a couple of points of light. So last week, uh, Senator Kuntz from Delaware chaired a judiciary subcommittee hearing on transparency and social media platforms uh, that's worth checking out all the testimony that fed into it, all the written testimony, about 300 pages worth. And that includes discussion of a bipartisan bill on platform accountability and transparency that would provide mechanisms for independent researchers to have more access to data about platforms and about their content display and moder uh, moderation algorithms. Um, the, uh, this is a really important step for countering disinformation that was already discussed. We need this and we need similar approaches to transparency and auditing where our governments are using data-driven tools like risk assessment algorithms, facial recognition, and uh, social media monitoring tools. The EU is also actively legislating at a more ambitious uh, scale with significant focus on transparency and compliance frameworks um, for large online platforms, as well as human rights due diligence requirements that I mentioned before. Um, and like the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation that some people might have heard about um, that focuses on data privacy, uh, these new norms will also have extraterritorial effects that need to be studied and understood from a global human rights perspective. And finally, just to pick up on uh, one of the things that Jay said about designing for uh, vulnerability and designing for human rights failures, there are innovations, um, especially in public interest, um, big public infra infrastructure projects like digital ID systems, these can be designed to be much more data min minimal. Um, and that's another point, I think, to echo the need for interdisciplinary discussions and engagement and at a global level, not only exclusively in wealthy countries in the global north, 
um, so that there's a, a much more, much better informed conversation about how to safeguard human rights in the context of, you know, these rapid changes in technological capacity. So I'm going to leave it there and hand it back to you, Andrea. Thank you, Laura, so much. I swear, I, I <laughs> love to be sitting with you and Jay and just having hours um, to talk through different things that you've presented. Um, I, because of the time limit, so we have five minutes um, and we have six questions. So I'm going to actually go straight to um, the questions, the audience questions, um, and we can have dinner in uh, New York or Carnegie Mellon, <laughs> Pittsburgh. Um, so the first question was, because a key element of both big data and virality is the velocity of data, could the negative aspects of social media be mitigated by slowing down the propagation of posts? For instance, imposing a two hour period between posting and publication. Jay or Laura, I think. That, that's a, I, I mean, that's a, um, a recommendation that I haven't heard. I, I do think that the, the velocity and the kind of volume of data has created all sorts of problems in, in many ways. I think, um, you know, because we have five minutes, the only thing I'll say is that on the positive side, it allows for perspectives and views that would not have made it into the public domain to actually get heard. And on the negative view, it allows for uh, the kinds of, um, you know, views that were once gatekept and, and prevented from making it into the public space to be kind of propagated and, and uh, sent out. And because um, there were many of those more controversial ideas uh, um, produce virality that, that we get kind of fringe ideas becoming mainstream. And I think that works really well, you know, in some cases you think of Black Lives Matter, um, but in other cases, uh, you know, maybe in the context of of uh, white supremacy, we we don't necessarily want that to happen. So I think it's a it's a complicated idea. I don't think delaying publication will uh, solve the problem, but I do think it's a big problem that we need to think about. Lord, do you have any um, comments? Maybe in the context of the Facebook um, case that Myanmar is bringing. Um, yeah, well, I was going to say, I think it's a Band-Aid. I think the, the, the particular idea, you know, um, wouldn't get at what, what Jay's describing too, which is the business model. You know, the idea, that, like, these are U.S.-based companies. They enjoy uh, really, uh, I mean, just almost no regulatory restrictions. Um, and so over the years, they've, they've developed uh, and amassed such an, a, a massive amount of wealth by volumizing data. And so I don't think that you can stem the flow um, through interventions like that. I think you have to go to the business model. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, I, you know, it doesn't sound uh, all of that ambitious, but I think just opening up some of the black boxes about how are they, how are they running their business um, is the key thing. So I, you know, that was why I chose to emphasize transparency. Another question is from Katie Smith, um, Katty Smith, uh, about how technology has impo impacted societal views of organizing protests. So, for example, what are the key differences between the French Revolution <laughs> and the Black Lives Matter protests? I'll just give a, a, a book title. Uh, it's right here. <laughs> Twitter and tear gas, I think, is the the place to go for that. Um, it's a, a, a we're human, so. Um, you know, I think that there are certain aspects of the world that we live in today that are novel, but at the end of the day, our brains haven't really evolved that much um, in a couple of hundred, you know, in, in four or 500 years. So um, many of the things that may seem new today have actually been happening for hundreds of years. Um, it's just the, the medium that we use to communicate has changed. And, and we have a lot more uh, data at our, fingerprint, at our fingertips at any, at any moment. Um, so, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure I completely grasped what the question is really getting at, but I, you know, I would only add that um, this is where having a really well-informed global perspective on regulatory interventions is so key because something that might make sense and, and the way we understand protest and how it operates and where, what, the param, what, what the freedoms really are in, in the United States is so different 
to other contexts, um, especially where I think Andrea, as you said at the beginning, where there's there can be real uh, lockdown and controls of the internet. Um, but I, you know, I would absolutely agree uh, that online, offline, you know, I, I think we can't be um, sort of lulled into a sense that the fact that we have recourse to internet tools um, drastically changes organizing structures or, you know, or repression um, and the way that, that it's performed uh, and who's performing it. So I'll just say that on the underneath the kind of uh, surface of um, of the use of of social media and and phones for organizing were were connections that were built over years and decades um, in the activist community. And so I think one of the main arguments that sociologists and anthropologists who study these things would would uh, would argue is that you can't have a kind of online uh, presence without human connections and and a detailed knowledge of the kinds of um, strategies that work to mobilize people. Okay, it's seven o'clock. Um, Lauren, I will follow your lead. Um, I'm okay to keep going on, but it's seven o'clock, so <laughs> I wanna be. Yes, thanks Andrea and Laura and Jay. Unfortunately, we do need to conclude the program uh, per our normal hour long schedule. I, I couldn't agree more. We could talk about this for so long. You all have introduced so many nuances and complexities and, and framed things that I'll say I thought that I understood in a way that made me pause and give some questions, which is exactly what we wanted to do. If only we had much more time. So thank you to you all for joining us and sharing your expertise, your experience and your leadership on this very uh, challenging and, and timely topic. And thanks to Philly Tech Week for partnering with the World Affairs Council to bring this conversation to our audience tonight. We appreciate all of your time. And for our members, thanks for joining us and guests and new friends. We're happy to meet you. We've got a couple of other programs coming up Tuesday. We are hosting the Council General of Israel for a conversation about all things Israel, geopolitical strategy, what's going on in Russia, um, tech, innovation, you name it, that's live and hybrid at the Suzanne Roberts Theater on Tuesday night. Uh, we are bringing back one of our favorites, Global Quizzo. It's back on June 6th at Love City Brewing in Philadelphia. So if you listen to a lot of our programs, maybe you'll get extra points and drink some great Philadelphia beer. And on June 14th, we're partnering with the Philadelphia Orchestra to bring a program to the Kimmel Center on the future of the European project with an expert on European Union politics, strategy, and geopolitical positioning. Thanks for spending the hour with us this evening. It went by far too fast uh, with us because we have such brilliant minds here to share their experience with us. Thank you and have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.